and their attendant evil racism have been the dominant forms of our torture. And national oppression and racism are still very much with us. Black people came to this country as many different nationalities, that is what many of you call tribes. We came as many different nationalities with many different subcultures of the African culture. Our history was systematically eliminated. Slavery, colonialism, imperialism always remove the oppressed from history. The oppressors always tell us that our only history is their history, that we exist as sidekicks for their historic development. Afro-American literature does not come to exist as a genre that is a body of work until the, late 19, until the early 19th century with the slave narratives. Frederick Douglass' narrative is a signal work, but also there's a fantastic display at the beginning of the 19th century, works by Henry Bibb, Linda Brent, Moses Roper, Box Brown, The Crafts, Wells Brown, James Pennington, Solomon Northrop, and many more. We say that Afro-American literature comes to exist once the Afro-American nationality comes to exist. We did not come to this country as Afro-Americans. We came as many different nationalities of African. The Afro-American nationality comes to exist as an amalgam of different African nationalities and the American experience. We say that Afro-American literature begins as a genre with the slave narratives because this, these slave narratives begin to ideologically reflect the concerns of the majority of black people. Say the literature of Phyllis Wheatley and Jupiter Hammond and some people who wrote earlier generally is the writing of house slaves who were writing that is with the permission of the slave masters. Black people, uh, it was against the law for black people to be literate for the first 200 years in this country. It was against the law for us to learn to read and write. You could be killed for learning to read or write. So that Phyllis Wheatley or Jupiter Hammond say Phyllis Wheatley writing about how good it is to come to America because now she can be exposed to American culture is not the ideological reflection of what the masses thought. The masses who were in the fields did not believe that slavery was a good thing. Ditto Jupiter Hammond who tells us that perhaps slavery is a good thing because it will teach us humility and so when we get to heaven we'll know how to act around God. Definitely that is not a reflection of what the Afro-American masses that is the great majority of black people felt. So that the slave narrative, the anti-slave narrative, is the beginning of the kind of uh, Afro-American literature as a genre that is produced by a new nationality, the African or Afro-American. At the same time that the slave narratives developed, and a little earlier, there were another group of writings that also emerged, a reflection of the struggles in the North against, I mean, with those blacks who were considered free, and I put that in quotation marks, and also next to free, I put ha-ha on the paper. You can't see that. <laughs> but this literature was a reflection of, uh, of the Negro Convention Movement, also in the early 19th century. And people like Henry Highland Garnett and C.L. Langston, C.L. Redman uh, emerged as powerful speaker writers. Also, David Walker, whose appeal in 1829 so rocked the slave country that it caused the slave plantation owners to even quarantine black sailors from coming in southern ports. But their fears were not uh, completely unfounded because about 18 months later, Nat Turner uh, rose in the most successful of the rebellions and killed 55 slave owners and their family. And it should be noted that Nat's raid was completely sanctioned by the Bible. That is, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. By the end of the 19th century, millions of black people began to leave the South. But as I said, still 60% still lived there. And eight out of 10 of us, even up here, were born there. They left the South because of they were trying to escape from the Ku Klux Klan fascism. They left because the boll weevils had eaten up all the cotton. They left because the capitalists in the North were now advertising for cheap labor because they were getting ready to go on the stage as international imperialists. That is, after they wiped out the Mexicans in the middle of the 19th century, by 1898, then they wiped out uh, Spain. That is, they kicked Spain out of Cuba and Puerto Rico and the Philippines to make those places safe for American investment. And so by the 20th century, the United States wanted to come on the scene as the full-up international imperialists, and so it needed cheap labor. And so it sent out the word for cheap labor, and the blacks began to go north. And if you check the blues of that period, or the literature of that period, it is about, a lot of it is about that migration, that northward migration. For instance, here's a couple of blues lyrics. 
Say, I'm going to get me a job now working in Mr. Ford's place. Say, I'm going to get me a job now working in Mr. Ford's place. Say, that woman told me last night, say, you cannot even stand Mr. Ford's ways. Or, my home's in Texas, what am I doing up here? My home's in Texas, what am I doing up here? Or, I'm a poor old boy, a long ways from home. Or, I'd rather drink muddy water and sleep in a hollow log than go up New York City and be treated like a dirty dog. Langston Hughes' important statement in 1926, the Negro artist in the racial mountain, serves as a statement to identify the concerns of a whole generation of black artists, not just writers, but black artists and indeed black intellectuals. He begins, the Negro artist in the racial mountain says, I want to be a poet. He says, one of the most promising of the young Negro poets said to me once, I want to be a poet, not a Negro poet, meaning I believe. I want to write like a white poet, meaning subconsciously. I would like to be a white poet, meaning behind that, I would like to be white. And I was sorry the young man said that, for no great poet has ever been afraid of being himself. And I doubted then that with his desire to run away spiritually from his race, this boy would ever be a great poet. But this is the mountain standing in the way of any true Negro art in America, this urge within the race toward whiteness the desire to pour racial individuality into the mold of American standardization and to be as little Negro and as much American as possible. That's a quote of Langston Hughes written in 1926. Much of the early Harlem Renaissance was black is beautiful, black conscious, attention to African heritage. And you can see the replay in the 60s black arts movement. People like Langston Hughes and Claude McKay were among the most important writers of the Harlem Renaissance, and also the middle writings of that period of W.E.B. Du Bois. And this literature showed the development of a national consciousness that reflects the need first of the people to defend themselves against their oppressors and then to attack them. In the 30s, there was an even sharper struggle in the black liberation movement, of course, because the bottom dropped out of American capitalism. People were on the streets starving, the depression, similar to the, 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 I guess we're going through the early phases of a depression right now. But because of this depression, the bottom dropped out of the exotic aspect of the Harlem Renaissance. And so now black writers saw themselves facing an even harsher reality. And the Harlem Renaissance so-called faded, that is, as Hughes said, when black folks were in vogue. The 40s, some of the radical ideas that existed in the 30s continued. Writers not only like Theodore Ward and Richard Wright, but also Margaret Walker and Gwendolyn Brooks, also uh, Brooks speaking with the Chicago tongue, Margaret Walker also speaking with the Chicago tongue, but also reflecting the experience of blacks deep in the heartland of the black nation in Mississippi, who still yearn for land, even though they live in the north or in some other city where they labor in the shadow of the plantation. It expresses this longing for land and power somewhere, or our dreams of equality and democracy remain just that, dreams. By the 50s, the United States had emerged from the Second World War relatively unscathed. It became the most powerful nation in the world. And so what they did during the 50s is try to systematically eliminate the radical ideas of the 30s. In other words, they accused these radical writers that existed in the 30s, they accused them of being traitors to their country. Not that told them they weren't trying to transform their country, they were traitors to their country. You heard of that called McCarthyism. You heard, for instance, of the Hollywood 10 locking up people for thinking that is, making a kind of inquisition in this country. For black writers, it was especially harsh. W.E.B. Du Bois was indicted as an agent of a foreign power. Richard Wright had to leave the country by 1946 and go to Paris, where his, he became increasingly more existentialist and less socialist. Langston Hughes was actually made to go down to the House Un-American Activities Committee and cop out before the great humanitarian fascist, Senator Eastland, and say that he was sorry he had written those terrible works in the 30s, but that he wouldn't do it again. And Paul Robeson was made in exile in his own country. They refused to let him use the concert halls or the stages, refused to give him roles in films and plays, had House Negroes testify against him in the halls of Congress, and finally drove him to his death. At the same time that this came to exist, the so-called new criticism came to exist, where people now told us that writing to be great could have no social consciousness. 
that to interpret writing, one had to remove it from its social category, from its social context. But you know, one definition of a liar is somebody quoting you out of context. But they said that now the literature had to re be removed from its context to understand it. And interestingly, most of these new critics, the core of them, were initiated by a core of Southern white writers like Robert Penn Warren, like John Crow Ransom, like Alan Tate, who said, for instance, that Southern society had produced a great culture except for the relatively minor flaw of slavery. But in the 60s, after this 50s period of reaction, and just after the civil rights uh, literature, in the 60s, another outburst of black literature centered in the major cities in this country emerges. And you can always tell when the literature is about to erupt because the people have already erupted. What the literature reflects is the struggles of the people. So that in 1964, for instance, when Blues for Mr. Charlie opened in February and My Own Dutchman opened in March and Malcolm X had been speaking before about what would happen in this country, it was only a matter of months until August in the Harlem Rebellion. Or in 1965, the Watts Rebellion. The writers did not create these rebellions as the judge thought when he sentenced me to two years for having written a poem. The writers did not create these rebellions. The writers were reflecting the actual mood of the people and what were reflecting what life, it was, what life itself actually was. And so in the 60s, the black arts movement focused in Harlem, but also throughout this country, began to reflect the struggles of the black liberation movement. We wanted to emulate Malcolm X, who came to oppose the black bourgeoisie who was telling us that we had to turn the other cheek that we would overcome someday, probably after we were dead. Malcolm X told us about self-determination, self-respect, and self-defense, and so the writers, the young writers of the black arts movement in the 60s wanted to reflect that. People like Clarence Reed and Clarence Franklin, Steve Young, Larry Neal, Sonia Sanchez, Yusef Iman, Sun Ra, uh, Ed Spriggs, Sam Anderson, Welton Smith, Harold Cruz, painters like Joe Overstreet and William White, uh, musicians like Albert Eiler and Sonny Murray and Archie Shepp and Milford Graves and Andrew Hill and Pharaoh Saunders. We were trying to reflect the actual movement of the Afro-American people for liberation. It spread from Harlem to uh, the West Coast where people like Ed Bullens and Marvin X opened up Black Arts West. In the Midwest, people like Woody King and Ron Milner took up the challenge opening theaters. And we brought our art into the streets. We performed before thousands of people. We read poetry in vacant lots, on street corners, in playgrounds. We put on plays out in the streets. And so we brought uh, black literature in the 60s to the people at large. Mao Zedong, in an essay called Problems of War and Strategy, points out that in capitalist countries like this one, when the time comes to launch an insurrection in war that is the civil war between the working class and its allies and the tiny bourgeoisie and its lackeys to end capitalism and end national oppression and racism and women's oppression, the first step will be to seize the cities and then advance into the countryside. And at that time, the cities will speak once again. They will speak again at the highest level of our epic. And that will be the most advanced and most beautiful literature that we can conceive of, at least right now. I'll end with these three slogans. Long live revolutionary artists of all nationalities. Liberation of the Afro-American nation. Long live socialist revolution. Thank you. People keep telling me to put my feet on the ground. I get mad and scream, there is no ground, only shit pieces from dogs and horses and men who don't live anywhere. They tell me, think straight, make something of yourself. Make something. I shout and say I am a poet. I write poems. I make words cartwheel and somersault down pages. Out of my mouth come visions distilled like bootleg whiskey. I am like a radio, but I'm a channel of my own. I keep saying I do this, and people keep asking me, what in the hell, is, what in the hell am I going to do? What in the hell is going on? Did somebody roll over the library with an atomic truck? Did Hitler really burn all the books? It's true. Nobody in the United States can read or understand English anymore. I must have been the last survivor of a crew from Mars. I mean, this is where someone in brown khaki comes to arrest me, and green x-ray lights come out of my eyes, and I can leap over skyscrapers and fly into the night. I can be sure no one will find me, because I am invisible to ordinary human beings in the USA. There are no poets who go to their unemployment officer saying, I'm putting down my profession as a poet. 
they are sure to send you to another office, the one for aid to totally dependent persons. <laughs> People keep telling me these are hard times. What are you going to be doing 10 years from now? What in the hell do you think? I'm going to be writing poems. I will have poems inching up the walls of Lincoln Tunnel. I'm going to feed my children poems on rye bread with horseradish. I'm going to give my, send my mailman off with a poem for his wagon, give my doctor a poem for his heart. I am a poet. I am not a part-time poet. I am not an amateur poet. I don't even know who that person could be. Whoever that is authorizing poetry as an avocation is a fraud. Put your own goddamn feet on the ground. Writers do not have to plan another existence forever to live schizophrenically, to be Jane Doe and Medea in one body. I have had it. I am not going to grow up to be something else. I am going to be old and gray and wizened as Aunt Mamie, and I'm going to write poems till I die. And when I have gotten out of this body, I'm going to hang around in the air and knock over everybody who got their damn feet on the ground. Was your, was your reading heavily poetic? Did you read very much poetry? We read a great deal of 